Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to uh, welcome a colleague, Sarah Bondick, to this, uh, this week's Jones Seminar. She's coming from the University of Cambridge in the UK, and she also works at Cancer Research UK at the Cambridge Institute. Uh, she has her PhD in radiation physics from the University College London from back in 2008. From there, she went and was a postdoctoral research fellow at both at Cambridge University and Stanford University, which sounds like a challenge, uh, uh, pretty far apart, uh, working in molecular imaging. Uh, after that time, she went back to the University of Cambridge and uh, established the Vision Lab at, at the university, developing new clinically translatable techniques for spectral imaging of the tumor microenvironment. She co-leads the CRUK Cambridge Center Early Detection Program, a new interdisciplinary initiative to accelerate clinical translation of novel diagnostics. She's published over 50 research articles on molecular imaging of cancer, and uh, she's been awarded the Institute of Physics Patterson Medal, the WISE Research Award, and the MSCA Prize in recognition of her work. And I have to say, having read some of her publications, I'm just... Uh, sort of astounded at how uh, innovative and, and, and really unique uh, her research program is. So it's really a, a treasure to welcome her here today on her stopover from a conference. And uh, uh, so her talk today is Shedding Light on the Tumor Microenvironment. So thank you. Great, so I hope I can live up to that rather uh, <laughs> extravagant introduction. <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm going to tell you about some of the biomedical optics techniques that we're using in our lab. And I'll start off by telling you a bit about why we might want to use optical imaging, uh, and particularly in the tumor microenvironment and what the, I mean by that. I'll then tell you a bit about the different endoscopy techniques that we're working on. So we're working on both structural, functional, and molecular endoscopy techniques. Um, and I'll just give a few slides on what I think are the perspectives for looking at these in the clinic. So let's start off with cancer and why we're interested in looking at the tumor microenvironment. So within my program, I'm particularly interested in trying to improve early diagnosis of cancer. And as you can see from this schematic, you get a much higher survival when cancer is diagnosed early, on the order of about three times higher across most cancer types. And at the moment, when we think about trying to screen for cancer, we do use a lot of imaging techniques. Those can be uh, imaging techniques such as mammography and, and colorectal screening, where we're not really being selective with the patients that we screen. We're just going for an age-related demographic. So after, past a certain age, we'll implement a screening program to look for early cancer, in these cases, in the breast and in the colon. So we're not being very selective with how we bring people into those programs. We do have other imaging-based approaches where we are more selective. So for example, with lung CT, we normally be picking out uh, individuals at high risk of developing lung cancer. Um, and also with esophageal imaging, which I'll come back to, the pa patients who are undergoing endoscopy there to try and look for early signs of esophageal cancer at the, the junction with the, with the stomach are normally those that have suffered, for example, from chronic acid reflux or developed a, a further metaplastic condition, which again, I'll tell you more about later. So these techniques, uh, both the ones that are just age-related and the ones that are high risk, they provide us with images which allow us to look for signs of early cancer. But what they don't tell you is whether that cancer is going to go on to kill the patient or not. So this is a major challenge, distinguishing the tigers from the pussycats in terms of cancer development, which of those early lesions are actually going to go on to be, do damage. So what we'd ideally like is not just a technique to detect early cancer, but also to work out which is the most aggressive disease and then to treat appropriately. At the moment, the current paradigm of kind of treating all of those lesions leads us to a case where we can end up with real over-treatment problems. So the medical kind of paradigm of do no harm then comes into question because you're giving chemotherapy or radiotherapy treatments, which could be quite damaging to normal tissue in the context of a cancer which may never actually go on to cause the patient any damage. So in several different malignancies, optical imaging is actually vital for early detection of the disease. And another point to think about here is the fact that Early detection isn't just about uh, finding the disease at a, a small stage. It's about finding the disease at a stage where we're able to make a minimally invasive intervention and essentially treat with curative intent. So we go in and we remove the, the lesion with the objective of curing the patient of that cancer. So in these particular three cancers, in skin, 
colorectal and esophageal, when we go in to treat those cancers, if we find an early lesion, we do expect that that patient will be cured. So for example, in skin cancer, often it's patients themselves who notice the abnormality. They're just individuals going about their daily lives and they'll notice something abnormal on their skin. They'll go to a primary care physician or have a look and maybe refer them to a dermatologist who then essentially all of them will be looking at the morphology of that skin abnormality, either with the naked eye or with some sort of magnifying dermoscope. And they'll be looking for the A, B, C, D, E's, uh, which are what tell you when you need to get referred in terms of the shape than the morphology of that lesion. If we think about colorectal cancer, it's quite common that, again, as I mentioned before, you've got some sort of age-related screening. In the UK, it's in the over 55s. Um, elsewhere in the world, the age will change. But normally, people will undergo a procedure, uh, either a sigmoidoscopy of the lower colon or a full colonoscopy, to look for small changes. So there'll be small distortions of the tissue, perhaps even full polyps. This can um, be looked at in uh, just an age-related demographic, but also in younger people who have a high risk. For example, those with ulcerative colitis or with Crohn's disease will undergo regular procedures looking for early signs of cancer because those particular diseases increase their risk of developing these polyps. We can also then, as I've mentioned before, look for esophageal cancer. And this is uh, the type of upper GI endoscopy that we might be looking for. In this case, we're often giving surveillance to patients who've developed a metaplastic condition called Barrett's esophagus. So just to go into that in a little bit more detail, because some of my clinical examples will come from as the esophageal uh, cancer. So Barrett's is a condition where the lining of the esophagus, the cells that make up that lining, they change to look more like the lining of the stomach. And that's because the cells are being exposed to chronic acid reflux, and they need to adapt to that acid exposure. So when they undergo that adaptation, they become, instead of being quite stratified and, and uh, elongated, they become more columnar. Um, and during that process, we develop uh, a more a larger glandular type tissue. And as the c condition progresses, areas of dysplasia or abnormal, abnormal cell growth can emerge, um, and ultimately those can lead on to adenocarcinoma. So just to give you an idea of the statistics here, this is a relatively rare disease. There's about 9,000 cases per year in the UK, but the prognosis is bleak, so it's less than 15% survival over five years. And if you just have Barrett's, your, uh, actual, your probability of getting this disease is relatively low. It's about 0.5% per year elevated risk compared to the population. However, as soon as one of these areas of dysplasia or abnormal cell growth appears within your Barrett's, that risk massively increases up to about 15% for the earliest stages of that dysplasia, up to as much as 30% for the latest stages. So what we really want to be able to do for these patients when we're doing the surveillance with endoscopy is we want to be able to pick out those early stages of dysplasia so we can treat them. And the great thing about this disease is that there is a direct treatment for this dysplastic Barrett's, which is either direct resection, if it's a small area, so we can use endoscopic instruments, put these forceps down inside and cut away at the tissue surface, or we can use radiofrequency ablation where we essentially burn off the cells of the esophagus and then they grow back afresh without the presence of dysplasia. The trouble for the endoscopist is that it's really quite difficult to spot. So this is a normal kind of healthy junction at the stomach. So you can see the pinker lining, I hope, um, of the, the stomach area, and then the pale pink lining of the esophagus. When the patients develop Barrett's, that small area of dark pink will expand and then cover a much wider area of the... Uh, thanks. <laughs> of, the, uh, of the image. Ooh, everyone's going to fall asleep now. <laughs> you can put the lights back on in a minute. <laughs> so from this region where we've got the expansion of the dark red, we then get to a region where it's dysplastic. So this is an extreme case where we actually do see some undulations in the um, endoscopic image. But in many cases, the dysplastic lesions at the very early stages just could be completely flat. So there won't be any macroscopic abnormality that you can see with the naked eye. Whereas with cancer, it's much more obvious. You start to get obstruction of the, of the food pipe, and the symptoms will then be issues with swallowing, which will become uh, more apparent. OK, so that's kind of a background about the, the types of cancers that we might want to look for with optical imaging. How do we go about looking for them? We can have some lights back now. 
Great, thank you. So I've already mentioned endoscopy, and I've shown you a couple of examples. We can do upper and lower GI endoscopy, but we can also use endoscopy uh, within the lungs through bronchoscopy and various other um, indications as well. And we can use optical imaging once we've diagnosed the disease, also uh, in advanced robotic surgery and in surgical microscopy. But most of these current optical imaging techniques, they, they work by ge generating white light images. So what do I mean by that? Well, they replicate what our eyes could see if we were able to look inside the body. So just to demonstrate how these cameras work, I'll pick a nicer scene than an endoscopy picture. Um, so if we take this nice image of a, a scene of flowers and we want to capture it with a color camera, we take our color camera, which might be something like you find in any of your smartphones, and we will pixelate that image. And each of those pixels will have a color filter on top of it, which replicates the vision of our eyes. So we'll have blue filters for our blue cones, green filters for our green cones, and red filters for our red cones. So that camera will be capturing uh, light in the same way, essentially, that our eyes are capturing the light. So we will then force color those pixels according to which optical filter is on top of each individual pixel, and then we'll interpret it between them. So we'll end up with an image that has slightly poorer spatial resolution than the scene, but has a faithful color recapitulation. So that's great if we just want to use the scene that our eyes can see, but optical interactions with tissue go way beyond what our eyes can see. So as many people in this audience will know, the simple reflectance that we capture with white light is only one of the many interactions of light with tissue. So here's an example of the reflectance, absorption, and scattering interactions. So we can have absorption of light by endogenous molecules like melanin in the skin, hemoglobin in the blood, and other molecules like lipids and water that make up our tissue structures. On top of that absorption, then we also have scattering processes. Often, scattering is occurring because of um, the presence of small organelles within cells, large nuclei, um, and other molecules around in the, or macromolecules around in the tissue structures. So the light, when it enters the tissues, can be absorbed and it can be scattered. But then many more things can happen. So, for example, if light is coherent, then it can um, have a, we have a known phase, and that light can be dephased as it travels into tissue. Similarly, if light is uh, well polarized into one particular polarization, it can then be depolarized or it can undergo changes in birefringent molecules in the tissue. So for example, as cancer develops, the tumor microenvironment, by which I mean all of the tumor cells uh, and its surrounding matrix, which is holding that, uh, that tumor together, in that surrounding matrix, we have many molecules like collagen and elastin, which are birefringent and can actually change the polarization state of light. We can also have nonlinear effects, um, vibrational spectroscopies. Um, the example I've given here is in Raman. And then we can have fluorescence effects where we put uh, one wavelength of light into the tissue and we get a longer wavelength of light back. And we can do that either with fluorophores that are intrinsically present in the tissue, many of these are metabolic molecules, or we can do it with, by injecting our own fluorophores, particularly those that are targeted to receptors of metabolic processes we might be interested in. In addition to all of those all optical interactions, we can also shine light on tissue in a pulsed fashion, and that allows us to generate acoustic waves, which we can detect with uh, ultrasound transducers rather than with optical cameras. So this is a huge range of different interactions that happen with light with tissue, and we work on most of these to some extent in my team. But what I'll focus on today is all of the interactions that we're looking at, particularly in, in endoscopy, um, in order to kind of focus a little bit the talk on the tumor microenvironment. So even these very simple optical interactions of just reflectance and scattering, um, reflectance, absorption, and scattering can tell us something about the intrinsic contrast in the tumor microenvironment. So here's a very simple diagram of the absorption and the fluorescence interactions of some of the intrinsic molecules. So just to put some labels on these, for example, we can measure oxygenation of blood vessels using the differential absorption of deoxyhemoglobin and oxyhemoglobin. And that's really useful from a, a, a perspective of characterizing cancer, because when a tumor is first developing, we have an abnormal proliferation of a very small number of cells. And as that number of cells grows, we'll end up at the case where some of the cells in the center of that mass will be beyond the oxygen diffusion distance from the local blood vasculature. And that's typically taken to be on the order of about 100 to 150 microns. And when that happens, those cells will start to secrete angiogenic factors and others that promote the growth of new blood vessels towards that mass. And this is kind of a process that's known as an angiogenic switch. 
So this abnormal proliferation of cells would have otherwise stopped its ability to grow. But by turning on this angiogenic switch and promoting the growth of new blood vessels into the tumor, we now have a new factor in the microenvironment. We have all of this blood vasculature, and that allows delivery of oxygen and nutrients to the tumor. And that's typically uh, expected to occur relatively early in cancer development. We can also sense other processes. So one particular process of interest is fibrosis. So that's the deposition of additional extracellular matrix proteins that make up the structure of the tumor mass without reciprocal degradation. And normally, this kind of exists in normal tissues in homeostasis, and it only starts in the case of a wound healing response, for example, in the development of scar tissue. Whereas in the tumor, we're being surrounded by processes like this, and it's essentially developing a wound that never heals. And we can use optical interactions to probe this. We can look at the presence of uh, fat and water through absorption, and we can look at molecules such as collagen and elastin through fluorescence um, and other processes as well. And of course, to survive this abnormal proliferation, the cells are often in a state of aberrant metabolism, and these molecules such as NADH and NAD and flavins, which are implicated in um, energetics, and tryptophan in amino acid synthesis, these uh, in individual molecules can tell us something about the metabolic behavior of the tumor. So just using optics without injecting any contrast agents, we can already interrogate sort of these three key factors you know, that are co common in early cancer development. And that might help us then to improve visualization of these early cancers. Taking these optical interactions, we then can translate into different types of anatomical detail. So I've already shown you quite a lot of images from white light endoscopy. And this is, uh, image basically comes from the fact that hemoglobin is dominating the absorption uh, of, of the white light. We can generate images from autofluorescence imaging, so we excite with another wavelength and we detect at a longer wavelength. And this is essentially dominated by emissions of, for example, NAD, FAD, collagen, and elastin that I just mentioned, so more of a metabolic status. And we can also develop methods for optical molecular imaging where we will have a fluorescence emission not from an intrinsic molecule, but from a molecule that we inject that's targeted to a particular area that we want to investigate. At the moment, typically, um, this is used routinely in the clinic, which is why I used it throughout my introduction. Um, it's essentially just replicating our eyes. It's easy, and all optical imaging scopes will do it. Some optical imaging scopes also do autofluorescence imaging. It has relatively poor specificity, so that's why it's quite challenging. And it's often used in conjunction with white light endoscopy, but many clinicians won't use it, even if it's available on their instruments. <clears throat> and finally, with the optical molecular imaging, this isn't used at, at all in the routine sense in the clinic, but it's under the very active area of research. OK, so then I'm, what I'm going to do for the major part of the talk is then go into a bit more detail into each of these three approaches and how we're advancing on that current status that I've uh, just shown you in the last slide. So let's first think about structural imaging. I mentioned in terms of the optical interactions with tissue that phase and polarization of light can be altered when they uh, fall on tissue. So in particular, what we're looking at is the potential of optical phase and polarization to be sensitive to this uh, early microstructural disorder. So I mentioned in the normal case of the esophageal um, lining, we've got this nice stratified epithelium. And then as we go um, towards cancer, then we end up in this rather disordered state. Now, both coherent light with a, a known phase and also polarized light with a known orientation or angle um, can be very quickly disrupted by interaction with, with even normal tissue, but really severely disrupted with interaction with disordered tissue. However, most cameras that we want to use aren't sensitive to phase or to polarized light. So these properties can't easily be exploited in endoscopy. However, recent advances that have come from telecommunications have allowed us to start to adopt these types of imaging contrast mechanisms in endoscopy. So one example is the approach of optical coherence tomography, which we don't actually work on in my lab, but gives a little bit of a nice example as to why phase information can be so interesting. So optical coherence tomography is quite similar to ultrasound, except you're doing um, it, ultrasound with, essentially with light instead of with sound. So you're working with interferometry of coherent light that's delivered and recorded via a single fiber optic. And it's often done in a scanning mechanism around during endoscopy rather than in a forward-looking sense. <clears throat> 
So you get images kind of like these ones, which uh, in this case it's an esophageal image where we've got uh, a, t a tumor that's um, deep inside, or a few millimeters deep inside the tissue, and then you can see a similar outline given by the OCT image. And even nicer, we can start to look at kind of commercial imaging systems which allow you to look at the stratified epithelium of the esophagus, and then notice as it goes towards Barrett's, we start to get, um, in the non-dysplastic case, um, a, a disordered structure, and then further towards a dysplastic case, you get these kind of features of dysplastic glands that can be easily identified. But the difficulty with these kind of optical coherence tomography approaches is that we are typically doing the side scanning approach. So one, that can be quite time consuming. Two, it doesn't allow us to biopsy the tissue while we're in there, um, although there are mechanisms being uh, developed to address both of those challenges. But three, you're looking at a pathology type image. So from a clinical translational perspective, this is quite challenging because you're asking an endoscopist who normally looks straight down into an organ to interpret data that's of pathology quality, it's cross-sectional through the organ. So we've got a whole kind of internationally trained cohort of endoscopists who have no idea how to interpret this kind of information. And that's been a real bottleneck in trying to get these uh, approaches into the clinic. So what we thought is, well, if this information can be derived from using uh, interference and dephasing of light, well, why don't we try to develop a technique where we can image that phase but in a forward-looking sense? Well, the reason you don't is because it's really, really hard, and that's why people haven't really tried to do it so far. But I was fortunate to team up with some collaborators from telecommunications who have a lot of experience in launching different modes of light down into optical fibers. So the reason it's hard is that typically non-uniformities in fiber bundles scramble the phase and polarization information. So if I put uh, a coherent uh, light source down into the fiber optic, ideally, at the other end, I want that same coherence to emerge. However, in reality, what happens is due to bending of the light, differences in refractive index between the individual fibrolets in a bundle, and also due to changes in temperature, air pressure, and various other things, that information is lost. So what I need to do is to somehow characterize the process by which the light propagates down this fiber optic, and that, that can be characterized by uh, what's called a transmission matrix, which tells me how each of the individual fibrolets propagates the light. And all I have to do is invert that matrix and apply it to my data to retrieve it. However, the challenge comes in actually measuring that matrix in real time. So what we've done is developed a kind of parallelized characterization structure, apologies for the complexity all appearing at once there, um, which can overcome this and allow us to invert. So essentially this instrument is um, divided into three main parts. The fiber bundle is in the middle here. That's the kind of important part. Tissue sample can sit here. So then we have an excitation arm and we have a detection arm. So on the excitation arm, we launch different optical fields of different types into the fiber. And we do this in a parallelized way. So if we have an imaging fiber bundle with 10,000 fiber cores, we'll be uh, pa characterizing between 10 and 100 of those cores simultaneously. And then we'll be moving that um, field around using the spatial light mod modulator in order to make sure that we illuminate every single optical core in that fiber bundle very rapidly. We then have a detection arm with another spatial light modulator, which allows us to measure the amplitude, phase, and polarization at the output as we're doing that characterization measurement. And when we do the characterization, we obviously don't have the phantom or tissue sample in place. So we take it out, we do the measurement of the fiber without anything in place, and then we pop the sample back in, and we now have a, a difference image, essentially, between that we can calibrate with that transmission matrix. So we have an output, a transmission matrix, and an input, and what we want to do is then uh, essentially recover our input, uh, given a known output and a known transmission matrix. So by doing this uh, pro characterization process, we do actually manage to retrieve those things, so this is the image, in this case, that we're sending in. CRUK is Cancer Research UK. It's our funding body, so you can see why we use that as our, our logo. Um, so we have amplitude, phase, and polarization information programmed from the first spatial light modulator. What we measure at the other end is essentially a noisy mess. Um, and then when we apply our transmission matrix, we can largely recover that original uh, amplitude, phase, and polarization information. But this is also in a perfect system, so we decided that the next key thing to do was to put in a series of tissue phantoms that would have properties much more similar to that of real tissue. So we started with a tissue mimicking phantom made of agarose gel, which had intralipid uh, doped into it, and uh, nigrosine dye for some background absorption. 
and we had increasing amounts of scattering, up to two and a half inverse centimeters reduced scattering, and we calculated um, not just the raw phase, but also a metric uh, defined as phase entropy, which is essentially characterizes the spatial variation in the phase measurement over, um, over the object. And this is a homogeneous object, so in principle, these images uh, should be pretty much homogeneous. So you can see there is still some heterogeneity, but we end up with a, a linear response of that entropy against scattering. We also then looked at um, polarization change by using a polyacrylamide gel in a stretcher. So we made a, a gel which we then clamped into a stretcher and um, just linearly strained across the field of view. Um, and again, you can see that the retardance um, changes as we increase the level of stretch, or in this case, uh, quantified as strain, um, and retardance again was linear with the amount of strain. Now, as you would have seen in the diagram at the moment, this particular system is in transmission. Um, the transmission mode operation is because actually doing this in reflection mode requires us to have a little bit more a priori information than we currently have with a standard imaging fiber bundle, and we're working on ways to do that. So to do a sort of tissue analysis, what we did was actually lift off the epithelial layer of some esophageal specimens that had either, were either healthy or had lesions in them. So we were able to then image them in transmission mode because they're essentially transparent. They're just a few cell layers thick. What was interesting about the results of that was that we were, um, when we did fluorescence imaging, you can essentially see like, no fluorescence in the healthy tissue and some fluorescence of different lesions in the diseased tissue. If we do amplitude-only imaging using the coherent light, there's essentially no difference between the two classes. But as soon as you image the phase, you get a much higher degree of um, phase entropy in the, uh, in the lesion regions than you do in the healthy tissue. And essentially, we got the same contrast-to-noise ratio using the phase imaging as we did using the fluorescent staining. So that kind of encouraged us that we might be able to uh, retrieve these results. But the challenges of this approach, as I've already mentioned, we have a challenge of trying to do this in transmission, and we also have a secondary challenge, which is that the time it takes us to compute the transmission matrix is still quite long. So at the moment, we can't do this process in real time, but what we would hope is that by uh, speeding up our computational implementation we should, and speeding up the frame rate of the camera that we're using, which is actually quite slow at the moment, we should be able to get this into within half a second. At the moment, we're about 15 minutes. So that's work in progress that we're still developing. Okay, so let's then think about functional imaging for a moment. What can we do in terms of functional imaging? So the use of coherent light has potential for looking at microstructure, but this is still just looking at anatomy. And I already told you there's much more available in tissue than just anatomical structural detail. What we want to do is interrogate these different properties of the microenvironment, in particular the ones I'm going to talk about here are the tumor vascularity, which is what we're going to look at with functional imaging, and also um, some cell surface receptor imaging, which we're going to look at with molecular imaging. What we want to be able to do by, by looking at this functional imaging of the tumor vasculature is not just be able to identify the presence of early lesions, for example, with the microstructural approach, but then also be able to do some staging. I mentioned before that this angiogenic switch happens quite early in the um, disease development. Now, approaches like this are already actually used uh, clinically. There's an approach in the clinic called narrowband imaging, which allows us to enhance the standard reflectance contrast by exciting the tissue at some narrow bands of wavelength. So when I do white light imaging, we typically put light from about 400 nanometers up to about 700 nanometers into the tissue. It's just a broadband light source, and we look at the reflectance of that light coming back. What narrowband imaging does is instead it says, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to excite some very narrow wavelength bands, which uh, coincide with the absorption peaks of the hemoglobins. And that allows you to go from an image like this, where you have quite a homogeneous pink image, to another image where you have much more structure, and you can see the fine structure of those individual blood vessels in the tissue. And that's just using a standard red, green, blue color camera. So it uses the same color camera as you use to do this image, but by changing the excitation light, I then get a much uh, more interesting image in terms of uh, diagnosing early cancer in the esophageal tract. So this is some examples of actually how it's used clinically. So it's not used in a quantitative sense, so you don't quantify the blood concentration or the blood oxygenation. It's used in a qualitative sense for within this agreed set of interpretive standards. So this is a, a, some consensus guidelines that are published. So when you have a regular mucosal pattern and regular blood vessels, which is 
what you may be able to see on the left here, um, then that's classified as normal. When you have an irregular set, so the, the vessels become uh, more disordered, and the mucosal pattern doesn't uh, follow with the blood vessel pattern, then you have an irregular pattern, and that means that you can classify that region as dysplasia and do a biopsy. So these guidance uh, uh, classifications have, all, have been approved by several gastroenterology societies as a set of guidelines that an endoscopist can use to decide whether or not to biopsy the tissue. So this approach is used clinically, it is available in a lot of clinical scopes, and provided the endoscopist has the appropriate training and experience, they're able to apply these guidelines and use that to reduce the number of random biopsies that they have to take. So if this three-color imaging with the limited excitation can already enhance the contrast, well, we thought, well, could we take this one step further and try to actually take some quantitative numbers out of this, for example, extracting the blood concentration and oxygenation? Well, to do that, we'd need to measure data at more than just a few narrow wavelength bands. We'd need to um, extract more information. And one way to do that is an approach called hyperspectral imaging, where you record not only the spatial dimensions of the image, but also the wavelength dimension at the same time. So now, instead of having a, a 2D image, we have a 3D image, and each individual pixel has a wavelength and profile associated with it. So what we can do then is we can use this spectral information to map out, for example, the actual uh, absorption of the different hemoglobins, which allows us to tell the difference between oxy and deoxyhemoglobin, and also, for example, detect some of the fluorescence emissions from the tissue. Again, this is something that's very challenging to do in endoscopy, and the reason is really that the instrumentation for hyperspectral imaging has typically been very bulky and very complex. So if you want to do uh, imaging with spectral data attached, there are different ways you can try it. So on a microscope, it's relatively straightforward. You take your, uh, your focused beam, and you have a 1D linear array spectrometer of some sort uh, in the detection end. Uh, you, you have some dispersion element, for example, a prism, and then you just scan that point, raster scan it over the tissue. So uh, that's quite slow, um, but is relatively cheap um, and can be... Uh, implemented without too much bulk. If you want to speed it up, that's where things start to get more bulky and a bit more expensive, so you can line scan, and then you typically need a 2D de uh, detector. One dimension encodes um, the spatial elements, and one dimension encodes the spectral elements. You need some more um, dispersive optics, and you need different focusing optics in order to scan that line. So you can get away from scanning if you, for example, have a detector that what we call stairs at the sample, so in this case, you might have a filter wheel, and every time you change the wavelength, you just move that filter wheel around, but you take the entire 2D scene in one go on a 2D detector. And then if you want to do all of this at once, so you want both the spatial and the spectral information, there's been lots of different ways that you can encode that, and this is an example where you split your image up into different um, replicates, and you send each one through a lens, and you disperse each replicate separately onto a different detector. So you can imagine this gets quite expensive because you need uh, a different detector for each element that you want to disperse. <clears throat> but what we've um, been looking at is different ways to um, adjust this um, snapshot type approach and also different ways to implement the spatial scanning that doesn't have the same temporal uh, implications as the existing one. But in order to do that, we first had to decide on some sort of clinically translatable framework in which we could implement this technology. And what we did for that is we used a device called a polyscope. So this is a catheter which goes down the accessory channel of any existing endoscope. So when you put an endoscope inside the body, there are normally additional um, channels that run through it which allow the uh, clinician to introduce forceps or to introduce bi uh, biopsy tools um, or wash catheters, etc. So if you have a specialist endoscope like this one, you can introduce that also down the accessory channel. And this itself has its own accessory channel, so you can still introduce your biopsy forceps and other things, and it has um, articulated control um, using this uh, kind of small set of um, hand pincers at the end there. So what this does is it, it's a disposable catheter that sheathes an imaging fiber bundle with 10,000 individual optical fibers, and at the end there's a, a glass cover that stops the imaging fiber bundle coming into contact with the patient. So this means that the complex optical part you can reuse, uh, whereas the part that comes into contact with the patients, you just dispose at the end of each study. 
You then have uh, an input for illumination and also an input, as I've said, for an accessory or for a working channel where you can introduce forceps. So we started working with this device uh, using several different uh, multispectral approaches. So the first one that we looked at was using um, multispectral imaging using color filter arrays, but ones with more colors available. So these were um, commercialized by a group from IMEC in Belgium. And instead of using a standard uh, dye-based color filter array, what they use is a series of Fabry-Perot etalons, which, uh, where the property of this etalon is that the thickness is selective for different wavelengths of light, according to the equation that you see there. So the advantage is that these filters are integrated onto the RGB camera in the same way as a uh, standard kind of color filter array, so they're deposited onto the camera array. Um, they're, they're very low cost and compact, and they're very robust, and you can deposit the filters in any way you want. So in this particular case, they're done in what's called a mosaic in the same way as this original uh, RGB color. So the disadvantage is that they're rather photon inefficient because you have your spatial array and you're only in each particular color channel detecting, for example, if it's a three by three filter array, you're only detecting one ninth of the light at that particular wavelength. So that's a, a disadvantage, but it's a very robust technology. So if it could be implemented, um, then it would have a lot of advantages in terms of its application. You're also collecting all of the information at the same time, so you don't have to scan through um, different regions. So we thought for an initial test, we would integrate that into our polyscope. So we took the kind of disposable polyscope catheter and we integrated into it a white light LED, which was coupled with a visible multispectral imaging camera and a laser diode, which was coupled with a near infrared multispectral imaging ca camera. And the reason for doing it that way is that our white light channel we're using for functional endoscopy, so for detection of oxy and deoxyhemoglobin. And our near infrared channel, we're using for molecular endoscopy, so targeting fluorescence contrast agents. And we can do then both of those in the same uh, imaging session. Now, the reason there's two different cameras here is that that Fabry Perot Etalon technology, um, at the time when we were building this, and still to some extent today, uh, we, we relied on different materials to fabricate optical filters in the visible and in the near infrared. So it wasn't possible for them to fabricate both filters on the same camera. So they've got better at that still, but the near infrared penetrance isn't as, as high when you're using a single material. And just so that you have a bit of context about the, the response of these particular cameras, um, so this, this quantum efficiency includes the spectral filter and the camera, and it's uh, essentially a smartphone camera behind, so it's not a scientific camera. Um, so that's why the percentage quantum efficiency is so low. What we wanted to do was just do a proof of concept to show that this idea, uh, in principle, would work. So these are very, very narrow bands, and in this case, it's a 5 by 5 mosaic, so there's 25 uh, color channels per camera, and here it's a 4 by 4 mosaic, so there's 16 color channels per camera. The performance in the visible is slightly worse because you get um, second, uh, sec essentially you get harmonics in the filters, uh, so you get some uh, bleed through into different color channels. So to test this, we thought, okay, well, we've, we've got limited sensitivity, so let's not go to the, the patient case. Let's go for phantoms where we can, actually, we can choose the concentrations of the dyes um, that we want to use from a fluorescence standpoint. So we again used tissue mimicking phantoms. We had embedded in that some capillaries with deoxygenated and oxygenated blood, and then different fluorescent dyes that could be excited with that same laser diode. So this is an image taken at a single wavelength, and this is a pseudo-color image taken after spectral unmixing. So we take a single snapshot image, and we then fit the spectral data, assuming the presence of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood, the three fluorescent dyes, and a reflectance background. And so from that, like the reflectance background is in black, the three fluorescent dyes are patterned around the edge, and then you can see the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood can also be resolved. To do that spectral fitting, we need to um, input some known spectra. And this is a not straightforward process because we can't just use reference spectra for those different uh, contrast agents or for um, the, the blood, uh, because in our entire endoscope, we have a series of different optical elements, all of which have different spectral properties. So we had to actually input the known spectra into a model, which then predicted what the spectra would look like independently of the, um, of the actual measurement. And when we do that, um, this is just a kind of the quantification results. So here we're fitting the, uh, um, the spectra for oxygenated blood against the image. And so this is just a breakdown of 
the scores plot for oxygenated blood and for deoxygenated blood. So you can see there's relatively little bleed over in those visible channels. And we're pretty good at being able to say which, uh, which blood type is present in those different channels. With the fluorescence, this is not quite exactly the case. You see there's a lot more bleed over between the different channels. However, with kind of looking at the, the maximum abundance, again, you can assign the correct fluorophore to the correct location. So we thought that was sort of encouraging, but of course I already highlighted some of the disadvantages of this system in terms of sensitivity. Another one is like the double artifact of having the f imaging fiber bundle, which already creates a kind of comb artifact in your image, coupled with a multispectral camera. So you can kind of see on here the individual spectral responses of the little pixel elements of the camera overlaid on top of the imaging fiber bundle. So this is not an ideal approach, and ideally what we were look at, the reason we were looking at these cameras is because you could actually integrate them on the tip of the endoscope, and that's how most endoscopy is done these days, is that the cameras are at the tip. Um, but in order to try it out in patients, we can't stick our, our camera on the tip because it's currently about that big. So we have to think about approaches to working with companies to integrate those or actually doing it ourselves onto the, onto the chip. But to overcome some of these limitations in the meantime, kind of prove the concept of how we could use this type of hyperspectral imaging, what we thought we would do is develop a, a scanning-based approach in order to maximize both the spatial and the spectral resolution. So this is a work that was done by a talented postdoc in my lab who thought about ways to combine both white light imaging and spectral imaging and use the relative merits of both to improve spatial scanning. So normally you couldn't even think about doing spatial scanning, hyperspectral imaging in endoscopy because there's so much movement happening. It's kind of moving around all the time and the body's moving at the same time. So what he thought was that, well, if we have a white light camera that's on the same light path as the spectral camera, then we can use the image data coming from the white light to generate a, a co-registration matrix for the data. And if we just put our slit down the center of the endoscope, as the patient moves or as the endoscopist moves the tip of the endoscope around, they will just scan out the hyperspectral imaging data in the same way as we do line scan hyperspectral, where we just scan the line across. So we were both a little bit skeptical, but I said, OK, let's try out and see how that works. So in the, I already mentioned there's some distortion. So in endoscopy, the endoscope can rotate, it can magnify, it can translate back and forward. And he used the white light data to generate the geometric transformation matrix and then applied that to all the spectral data in order to reconstruct a kind of distortion-free hyperspectral cube. So the wide field registration meant that we could run this thing in real time. So this is just a simple printed target. And this is my postdoc waving the endoscope over the target. So now here's the endoscopy field of view, the co-registered panoramic image, and the hyperspectral data at several exemplar wavelengths. So in each of these uh, acquisitions, we're getting 100 spectral channels simultaneously. And these are just a couple of exemplar ones where you can see, for example, uh, we've got the red data here that's uh, not visible, and we've got um, the blue data here that's not visible. So we then went on to see if we could use this spectroscopic information that we're gathering um, to actually measure this hemoglobin concentration oxygenation. So move on from just being qualitative uh, to being quantitative. So again, we did this in a tissue phantom with uh, blood-filled tubes. We did it with both encapsulated tubes of known oxygenation and um, image very quickly, and also with a flow phantom where we have uh, online oxygenation and deoxygenation of the blood. So these are some single wavelength images, um, but, and here are some spectra that were extracted. And again, we did that same um, modeling process to account for any spectral distortions in our imaging system and extracted then the oxygen saturation level, which showed a similar um, behavior in terms of its drop-off uh, as the PO2 that was measured with an external oxygen sensor. So that was quite promising. And the next thing we decided to do was actually just to have a look at some real tissue. So this isn't ideal because the tissue has been taken out of the patient, so all the blood is deoxygenated. But we thought in order to motivate doing an in vivo study, we should at least have a look and see if we can see any spectral differences ex vivo. So we did a series of biopsy studies from several patients who were undergoing biopsies uh, because they had Barrett's esophagus, and they were looking for signs of dysplasia in those uh, biopsies. So this is some RGB images that we synthesized using that hyperspectral data set. So we can put a, a synthetic RGB filter in just by taking the RGB um, normal filter profiles and convolving them with our data set. And then we extracted some spectra from the different tissue types. 
And although the numbers here are too small to really make a statistical analysis, we thought it was interesting that, at least on the face of it, um, the Barrett's esophagus looks different from the gastric mucosa and from the squamous epithelium, and that, again, the esophageal cancer looks different from the Barrett's esophagus. Now, unfortunately, in this um, in initial case, we didn't have any cases of dysplasia, so we weren't able to see, actually, whether we see any differences in this intermediate stage, um, but we are uh, looking forward to being able to interrogate some of those uh, in our next few studies. Finally, I wanted to tell you a bit about the molecular imaging, and I think this is really target, focused on the use of targeted fluorescent contrast agents. And it's generated a lot of excitement in the field, but I think it's still very challenging, particularly from a diagnostic perspective, to get many of these contrast agents into clinic, and ours is a, a story of woe in that sense. But um, we're working on a, an optical molecular imaging agent that was developed by some collaborators, and it's a fluorescently labeled lectin. The lectin is called wheat germ agglutinin, and it's essentially a food additive that sticks to the sialic acid residues on the outside of cells. So these are um, kind of sugar residues, and when you have normal tissue, it binds very, very readily. Um, and as the, the um, cancer progresses, it behind, like, binds a lot less. So this is an example from a resection specimen of esophageal cancer with a white light image. And here's the autofluorescence image of the same cancer. And then after spraying this dye, you can see that essentially the white light image is basically no abnormality visible. In the autofluorescence image, there's something suspicious in this region. But in the uh, image with the sprayed lectin, there's really an extensive area of abnormality that was present. And essentially, we were looking for this binding. So reduction in binding um, um, happens when you get to high-grade dysplasia. And it's essentially no binding once you get to esophageal cancer. So it's a reduction in binding that we're visualizing. So this has several disadvantages, the first of which is that it's a negative contrast agent, so you have to look for a no. Um, and the second of which is that you're looking for a no in an undulating and inhomogeneous tissue uh, with the perspective of an endoscope. So I won't talk about it today, but something that we've uh, looked at to try and address this, and I know several people in the audience work on a similar approach, is using uh, dual agents. So using one targeted contrast agent, which is the fluorescently labeled lectin, and one untargeted, and spraying them with a, a catheter over the same tissue surface. So we can look for which binding is actually specific to the lectins. So the uh, sensitivity displays are here isn't, uh, um, was only in a small number of specimens, and it was verified in a larger number by using these resections called endoscopic mucosal receptions. So these are quite large resections of tissue. And what we do when we take these out is we pin them onto a board, and we then spray the fluorescent contrast agent on top. We do a wash step, and then we image. And when we image, um, after we've imaged, we take guided punch biopsies. So that's what these are highlighting here. So we punch at particular areas of dark, medium, or bright contrast. And then we go undergo a very, very complex process of trying to co-register this to histology. So the challenge of getting the diagnosis for histology is that we're imaging face-on to the tissue sample. And the pathologist, as I mentioned earlier, looks cross-sectionally at the tissue sample. And this is exactly the same in our case. So what happens is that this sample goes to pathology. They make cuts at two millimeter intervals. So this is what these cuts are. And then they look cross-sectionally, and they grade those regions as to what's the highest um, grade of disease that's present. And then they give us back one of these maps. Now, you can imagine there are all sorts of co-registration problems here, not least of which the cross-sectional one, which is that once we've taken this um, sample out and put it into formalin and sent it to the pathology office and they've stuck it in their um, system to section, all sorts of distortions can come into play. And so we did a lot of um, work trying to model, actually, what types of distortions we might see and trying to improve our co-registration. So we've now got to a point where we're relatively confident that we've trained our pathologists to actually do, cut the sections and do the analysis in exactly the way um, that we want them to in order that we can accurately reconstruct. So from that, we could then extract the mean fluorescence intensity between non-dysplastic and dysplastic tissue. Note that there is quite a lot of overlap here. One of the limitations of this endoscopic mucosal resection is that it's a few centimeters squared, and the normal tissue that's graded normal actually isn't really normal. It's just not um, dysplastic, or, uh, so it doesn't fall into any of the other grades. So often there are abnormalities present in the normal. Um, for example, it might be um, Barrett's uh, that's present, but it won't really grade in the same way. Um, but you get a reasonable area under curve when you're looking at that. 
So the challenge that our collaborators had was that they had been uh, labeling this with FITSI, which is a visible dye, and that the fluorescence was just being drowned out by autofluorescence. So we worked with them to make a bimodal endoscope that would do white light endoscopy and would do near-infrared fluorescence so that they could tag uh, with a near-infrared dye, which they used IR800 for. Um, so this is, again, based around the polyscope, but now we just have two channels, uh, one of which is just a white light camera and one of which is an EMCCD for high sensitivity detection of the near-infrared. So now the white light channel is again for conventional, um, is now for conventional endoscopy <coughs> rather than spectral endoscopy, and the near-infrared channel is just for um, picking up long emissions in the near-infrared. So we're not doing any spectral imaging in this uh, optical molecular imaging approach. So what we did was take some fluorescence wide field images using um, the fluor beam and interoperative imaging system. We took the same wide field images using our endoscope. It's a bit unfair in terms of the image quality because the endoscope was set way back in order to be similar to the fluor beam. Um, so then our image quality is much poorer. But you can see there's roughly a visual agreement between the areas of high intensity and red between the, the different samples. Um, and there's a reasonable correlation in all cases between the two sets of intensities. And the contrast for dysplasia was, again, present. So you could um, outline regions according to the pathology map and calculate the intensity. Uh, but the contrast wasn't as high as we'd hoped for using the near-infrared. We'd hoped that we'd get over all the problems of autofluorescence and we'd just have this amazing contrast. Uh, but of course, we still have this kind of problem with the fact that there's quite a lot of overlap between these distributions. And the same is true when you actually look at the histogram of the intensities in individual um, sections. So that's something that um, my collaborators are working on, trying to look at different, uh, different lectins, for example, um, and also looking at whether if we take just normal healthy tissue biopsies away from the disease site, whether there's a greater degree of contrast there. So in the, just the last couple of minutes, I wanted to kind of give you my perspectives on where I think we are with this endoscopy work and how we think, I think we could use it uh, in the future. So I think these advanced optical endoscopy techniques hold a lot of potential for use um, in uh, looking at the tumor microenvironment, particularly looking at aspects of tumor vascularity and oxygenation, um, looking at microstructural aspects, such as the fibrosis changes, and also looking at changes in um, cell surface receptors and signaling um, in those particular molecules. So they all provide complementary contrast. So this phase and polarization endoscopy could help us to enhance the existing white light by looking at the microstructure in more detail. The hyperspectral endoscopy could go further than the existing narrow band by going not just looking at the vascular structures, but also now looking at the blood concentration and the oxygenation values. And then the molecular endoscopy, we're targeting particular changes that are known to happen in the disease. So in principle, we could then enhance the contrast still further. And maybe a combination of multiple methods will be necessary. Um, as is currently done, we actually, the white light endoscopy has a great specificity, but a terrible sensitivity. So it's often combined with narrow band, which is more kind of the other way around. And so the endoscopist will use several different techniques in order to try and combine the information from all of them and improve their diagnosis. In terms of improvements, at the moment, we're really talking improvements in image quality, because we're using this imaging fiber bundle, and also improvements in temporal resolution. So in terms of image quality, our limit is the fiber bundle. Um, we could actually deploy several of the methods I've described using a camera on chip. That includes now um, more opportunity to do phase imaging as well as to do um, the standard color multispectral array imaging. Um, in terms of temporal resolution, in, for the things I've shown you, the data acquisition ranges from sort of 10 milliseconds up to 25 seconds. Um, and the data processing time can range anywhere from 5 to 50 minutes. So obviously, this data processing time is uh, not ideal. The data acquisition, we can largely speed up just by using faster cameras. We mostly just have sort of things that were lying around the lab that are quite slow. Um, and just buying a, a newer camera would solve the data acquisition problem. But this is, for us, something that we're needing to develop more expertise in. None of our code runs on GPU yet. So we would need to get all of those kinds of things working um, to try and improve the speed. Um, so improvement in sector sensitivity could be another way to increase the data rates. I mentioned that the um, multispectral imaging cameras are just fabricated on smartphone cameras, so they're not really scientific grade. If we can deposit those optical filters onto a more scientific grade um, camera, then obviously that will speed up our data acquisition times as well. And as I said, transferring our analysis algorithms onto GPU could improve our processing times. <coughs> 
So there's lots of things that we still need to do, um, but I'm at least encouraged by these preliminary results, and so are our clinical colleagues, because they actually um, opened a dedicated research endoscopy suite for us at the, the hospital, which is currently still just an empty room, but has a dedicated space uh, for an optics lab, which we've currently ordered all the equipment for. So at least someone's been convinced that there's potential that these techniques might be useful in the future in the clinic. So with that, I'd like to uh, just kind of summarize um, tell you a little bit about uh, the lab. So I'd like to thank the people involved in this work. So George Gordon has pioneered the phase and polarization work. Um, Siri and Jung Hee really pioneered the hyperspectral imaging work, and Dale, the optical molecular imaging work. None of this would be possible without our clinical collaborators in the esophagus, Rebecca and Massey. Um, and we're actually uh, hiring at the moment a postdoc to work on in vivo imaging of, in photoacoustic imaging, which I didn't talk about today. But if you're interested, check out our website or come and speak to me afterwards. So thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions.